the Defending Rights and Dissent and the Nation Town Hall on Coronavirus and Civil Liberties. For those of you who are unfamiliar with either group, Defending Rights and Dissent is a national civil liberties organization that was founded in 1960 by uh, people who were targeted by the House Un-American Activities Committee, hence my nice artwork. Um, and since then, it has upheld the belief that dissent is essential to a democracy and works to fulfill the promise of the Bill of Rights for everyone. Uh, the Nation magazine was founded in 1865 by abolitionists. It maintains the belief that independent journalism has the capacity to bring about a more democratic and equitable world. Uh, its investigative reporting has launched and continues to launch congress congressional hearings, force political change, and shape new cycles. Um, so this is a very exciting night. Uh, we have a very exciting panel just to set the stage a little bit. Uh, obviously, we are living through a very uh, difficult and dark time with the pandemic. Uh, there is an extraordinary crisis, and I think most of us would agree that an extraordinary crisis requires some degree of extraordinary response. Uh, but many of us have also for a long time worried about how the government sort of responds to emergency situations um, in ways that allow them to curtail or grow their power in ways to sort of abuse political or civil rights. And with the coronavirus, while I think many of us support public health measures like the stay in place, there's very serious questions about what happens when the police start to share them. Or what about the fact that the United States is the largest uh, jailer in the world? Can we maintain, is this sort of large population of people in prisons and immigration detention centers and jails, is that compatible with stopping the community spread of the virus? And what if we enact surveillance powers now that then come back to be used in other ways? Um, with that being said, I'm going to introduce our panel because I'm very excited to be with them tonight. We are joined by Ken Klippenstein, who is the nation's DC correspondent. In recent weeks, he has covered the Trump administration's response to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, he's had a lot of exclusive exposés in the nation about how Customs and Border Patrol and other branches of the government are responding to the coronavirus. I'm very excited that he is joining us. Uh, we are also joined by Azadeh Shashahani, who is the Legal and Advocacy Director at Project South. She's the past president of the National Lawyers Guild. She previously served as the Director of National Security and Immigrants' Rights at the American Civil Liberties of Georgia. She works for a number of years in the US South to protect the human rights of immigrants, Muslims, and Middle Eastern and South Asian communities. Uh, she's edited several human rights reports, including Imprisoned Justice, inside two immigration detention centers in Georgia. And she's been on Democracy Now! in Jacobin and I believe the nation as well. We're also joined by Sarah Lazar, who is a web editor in these times. In addition to being a fantastic editor, I, I can affirm that myself having worked with her, she is also a fantastic journalist who comes from a background in independent journalists from such publications, including The Nation, you're noticing a theme here, Tom Dispatch and Al Jazeera. Uh, she coded the book about face, military resistors turn against war, and she got her start in journalism reporting for the independent media center movement and has organized against US militarism at home and abroad. And she's going to be talking tonight about how to sort of make how is, if militarism is a response to the coronavirus or an appropriate one. Um, next, we have Alex Vitale. Uh, he's a professor of sociology and a coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College. Uh, he wrote the book, The End of Policing, which has challenged the way a lot of groups like mine and I'm sure other activists and just people out there think about how we deal with the issue of policing in prisons. And then last but not least is Patrick Eddington, who is a research fellow at in Homeland Security and Civil Liberties at the Cato Institute. He also, from 2004 to 2014, uh, served in the Congressional Office of Representative Rush Holt. And before that, he was a whistleblower. And I can affirm um, from experience, he is one of the foremost experts on surveillance in this country today. So with that, why don't we start with Azadeh, who has been organizing against ICE detention in Georgia? Great, thank you so much. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. 
So thank you so much to Chip and Defending Rights and Dissent and The Nation magazine for organizing this forum tonight. Um, so yes, I will be focusing on immigration detention because it's a really dire situation right now. So as of early April, ICE was holding more than 32,000 people in detention in more than 200 facilities nationwide, including the Stewart Detention Center in Georgia, where I am which is the second largest immigration detention center in the country and can hold about 1,900 immigrants. So um, many of the larger facilities are actually run by contractors that are primarily prison corporations. So for example, Stewart is operated by CoreCivic, formerly the Corrections Corporation of America, CCA, which is the largest prison corporation in the US. And um, in light of the pandemic, uh, ICE, instead of doing the right thing and actually um, releasing everybody, is saying that it's going to make the decisions about release on a case-by-case -case basis. And so what this has meant is, as of March 30th, ICE had released only about 160 people it itself had identified as eligible. Um, you know, if they wanted to, they could have already released everybody. Um, and um, the, the result is that, you know, as of now, um, we have 100 confirmed cases of COVID-19 among detained immigrants, according to ICE. There could be potentially uh, many more. So, for example, uh, as part of the response to a lawsuit, ICE admitted that there are at least 30 individuals at Stewart who are likely infected with the virus. Um, not, you know, not, and that 30 is not included in the 100 um, confirmed cases nationwide that they have um, already confirmed. Those are presumptive cases. And um, of course, we know that ICE lies all the time. Um, they are not transparent at all. And oftentimes, um, it takes a long time before they are forced to release information. So there could potentially be many more out there that ICE is not admitting to yet. In terms of the employees, um, there are 25 ICE employees at detention centers that ICE has confirmed um, have COVID-19. And um, of course, this 25 does not include the individuals employed by the private prison corporations. Um, so for example, at Stewart, there are, um, as of this moment, what we know, there are seven employees at the Stewart Detention Center uh, who are employed by CoreCivic who also have um, COVID-19. Um, at Stewart, people are not receiving the protection or care that they need. Um, the same goes for every other <laughs> immigration detention center in the country. And of course, as you can imagine, social distancing is a joke. It just cannot happen in an immigration detention center. Um, it took ICE a very long time to even provide the guards with the protect protective equipment, including masks. Um, so at Stewart, uh, for example, where um, again, there are seven detained immigrants and seven employees who have contracted the virus already. Immigrants are reportedly not receiving sanitizing equipment for their personal belongings, basic protections like masks and gloves, or even minimal hygiene products like toilet paper. Um, there have also been reports of overcrowding um, at Stewart where immigrants are forced to sleep on the floor. Um, at another detention center in Georgia, Folkestone, an immigrant reported not being able to get disinfectant a spray and receiving little to no soap. Similarly, at the Irving County Detention Center, another very large and problematic detention center in Georgia, where one immigrant has already tested positive for COVID-19, immigrants reported not receiving soap for a week, being unable to sanitize personal belongings and not re receiving masks. Um, in addition, at Irvin, um, the open unit um, where about 100 women are housed is only disinfected once a day. Um, and um, there are also about 120 detained women um, in a trailer unit, um, and they don't even have enough space to walk around. Uh, you know, again, <laughs> no opportunity for social distancing in such a space. And um, uh, in uh, Stewart and uh, other facilities with active quarantine or known cases of COVID-19, they continue to receive and transfer detained people in clear violation of CDC guidelines. Um, and just the words of a detained immigrant at Stewart, we are scared here, we cannot keep the distance of two meters, um, let alone uh, more. 
that is called for. All of us are placed together. We are 76 people in every section. There doesn't exist a way to be able to avoid an outbreak. Please, we ask for help from everyone. We are human beings. We also need to be with our families to be able to help them. And so this is a situation now, we already know that these facilities have had a horrible record. So Stuart, for example, is a deadly facility. There have been four deaths since May, 2017, two of them by suicide, two of them due to um, illness. There's forced labor that is happening at this facility. The hygiene situation was already horrible with water reportedly being green at times. The food at this facility is often inedible with foreign objects in it sometimes. So obviously a facility like a steward is in no way able to deal with a pandemic. And so people are resisting. Um, so there are hunger strikes in various detention centers, uh, at least 14 hunger, confirmed hunger strikes across the country. Other forms of protest, so for example, people refusing to go back to their cells people making videos about their situation and sharing them uh, with the media and talking to the media. And so ICE and the prison corporations, instead of addressing people's concerns and uh, freeing people, they're cracking down on the protest. Um, they are using pepper spray and putting people in solitary where they're, they are denied essential supplies like toilet paper or toothpaste. And when people talk to the media about the situation, ICE and the prison corporations engage in retaliation, such as cutting their access to phones. So what needs to happen? Obviously, the lives of thousands of immigrants are on the line, in addition to the workers. And ICE must immediately release, Im release immigrants from immigration detention centers before we see an even larger catastrophe. And something that a lot, of, a lot of us have been working on for a long time is that these facilities need to be shut down, all of them. You know, we're not, we've never tried to um, just to make them prettier. We want to get rid of them as a whole and to free people. So um, what people can do at this moment to support, there are still protests happening outside of detention centers while observing social distancing guidelines. So people basically staying in their cars and um, trying to persuade um, the prison guards from, you know, dissuade them from coming to work. Um, and um, contacting Congress as we did here in Georgia through um, a letter that was um, signed by 50 organizations in addition to Project South um, we need to put pressure on Congress to investigate ICE and these prison corporations right now. Um, there's also a piece of legislation, the Federal Immigrant Release for Safety and Security Together Act, um, FIRST Act, that was um, recently uh, dropped, co-sponsored by Representative Jayapal and Senator Booker. The act provides urgent and critical restrictions on immigration detention and enforcement during this public health emergency in order to protect immigrants and our collective health. And the act requires the release of individuals at heightened risk of contacting COVID-19 um, with some exceptions, exceptions and the filing of reviews with a presumption of, a presumption of release for everyone else. So it's definitely a significant step towards the goal of releasing all people from detention and imprisonment, which is what we need. Uh, in conclusion, I also wanna say that we should be in active solidarity with people in the global South impacted by the pandemic, uh, specifically Palestinians, uh, in light of the fact that tomorrow is Palestinian Prisoners Day. Um, there are many, many events happening, um, just a couple of them. Jewish Voice for Peace is having a Zoom rally at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then there's a webinar with Sahar Francis of Ad Damir, um, which is a really great organization working in Palestine um, with Palestinian um, political prisoners um, at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, so you can find the information for that event on the social media platforms for US Palestinian Community Network. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for giving us both that very um, disturbing presentation on conditions in Georgia as well as giving us some tangible steps we can take to mobilize around and contact our members of Congress and Defending Rights and Dissent will reach out to its supporters either this week or next week and mobilize them to take those actions again with Congress. So we just heard about what ICE detention looks like at the local level. 
Um, next, I'm going to go to Ken, who's had a number of exposés in the nation about how Customs and Borders Patrol and other federal agencies have been responding or not responding to the COVID crisis. Hi, everyone. Um, if I was to characterize the uh, response to COVID on the part of the administration, but also the uh, various uh, parts of the executive uh, government, I would uh, call it, um, I would say that they are taking advantage of it in, in a number of different ways in order to advance their very hardline immigration um, policies, as the previous speaker pointed out. So for example, I found out very recently um, that Customs and Border Protection, that's um, the part of the Department of Homeland Security, which includes within it uh, the Border Patrol as its most uh, you know, recognizable um, component, uh, they requested a, a very large sum. Uh, they, they, they requested from the Defense Department, the Pentagon, uh, military support at the southern border, which we already have, and that's controversial itself, but also at the Canadian border, uh, which historically is you know, one of the longest uh, peacetime borders uh, in recorded Western history, certainly. And I think that would be a very inadvisable, um, you know, uh, uh, direction uh, to take that border. I, it's bad enough that, you know, the southwest border, um, you know, at present has something like 5,000 U.S. Uh, military personnel. But um, to introduce that kind of a dynamic um, with the northern border, um, I think would be a departure from anything that we've seen in, in you know, certainly in, in living memory. Um, and I, I think that's a good sort of illustration of the manner in which this administration has tried to take advantage of a very legitimate and you know real crisis, which um, you know I do think that there are defensible um, uh, sacrifices that the public could be asked to make. For example, um, you know social distancing, um, things that are clearly un unpleasant and are going to have you know a um, harmful short-term effect on the you know economy. Um, I, I do think that a lot of those are defensible, and I even think that. Um, uh, you know, there is constructive things that the military can do. And I don't mean civil defense, um, but for example, uh, talking to folks in the military, I've learned that there are very extensive and a lot of quite sensible plans in terms of um, distribution of uh, personal protective equipment, distribution of aid, things like that that they can do that, uh, you know, don't uh, come anywhere near, you know, the sort of civil defense that we think of uh, when we think of militarization of um, not just the border, but then, uh, you know, use of National Guard and things like that. I think these things would be, you know, positive and they uh, both have the plans to carry them out and the resources to do so. I mean, we have a, you know, huge record Pentagon budget and I can't think of a better example of a case in which we might want to use it um, than, you know, logistics uh, distribution of uh, these sorts of, these sorts of things, not just, not just personal protective equipment, but also um, basic food and things that people are going to need as, uh, you know, employment sort of drops off a cliff. So um, the plans are in the books. They're very detailed plans. A lot of it's quite thoughtful. I've spoken to you know many members of the military. Um, it's sort of a we're sort of a liminal space. Um, speaking to civil rights um, experts, where they are nervous that the Trump administration may try to you know uh, use this crisis as a sort of um, springboard for you know uh, pursuing what you know very clearly is that a certain author authoritarian streak within you know President Trump. Uh, but also they've become increasingly nervous that he might not do an, that he might not do anything. Initially, the concern was that he's going to use this. Um, and I guess one example would be the you know militarization of the Canadian and increasing militarization of the southern border. Um, but there are also, as I said, good constructive things that he's not pursuing. So the question almost at this point is, um, is he going to you know entrust the response to this very real crisis to the private sector as he has done um, praising you know corporations, CEOs, uh, for the, you know, frankly, very limited forms of support that they've given. Uh, and that's not even necessarily a knock on them. It's just that the private sector does not have the resources and infrastructure like our federal government does to be able to respond to something like this. Um, and so there, there is a lot of uh, trepidation, not just that he'll, um, you know, pursue the, the worst aspects of a federal government response, but then overlook um, some of the constructive ones. So uh, sort of in a nutshell, that's, that's how I would characterize the uh, the role that the uh, military and the executive, various executive agencies might 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 play in, in response to this problem. Uh, thank you, Ken, for that presentation. It has been sort of fascinating to watch both the fears of the government overreaching mixed with Trump's sort of, at times, unwillingness to take the crisis seriously or unwillingness to do anything because he wants to do other political things instead. Um, next, I'm going to move to Pat, who's going to tell us what he's been concerned about and, and working on. <clears throat> Chip, thanks, uh, and thanks to uh, Drad and the Nation for sponsoring uh, this event tonight. I want to start with uh, the specific, and I'll work my way out uh, kind of to, to the general propositions. 
and I'll start with what I think is probably on a lot of people's minds because it's been so much in the press over the course of the last uh, week or so, especially the last few days. And that is this whole issue of contact tracing and for example, Apple and Google announcing this uh, partnership uh, to try to develop essentially, you know, Bluetooth technology that would be used for this purpose. I, I think what's important to understand about this, when we talk about trying to find sensible ways to deal with a very insensible crisis, the, the biggest one that our country has faced, certainly domestically in my lifetime, is that we have to, in my judgment, be focused on what actually works and that is simultaneously uh, completely in tune with the constitution or our constitutional values. And when we think about contact tracing, I think what's important to understand is that no system of contact tracing, whether we're talking about an electronic version or the more traditional going door to door version can work unless you have the right kinds of blood tests and related serology tests up front that are actually reliable and validated. And as uh, USA Today made very clear in a piece that they uh, put out just yesterday, uh, we're not there yet. There are some real concerns and I think some real questions about the reliability of a lot of these tests. You know, there are at least 90 different tests now that are allegedly going to be on the market coming from a variety of vendors. And the number one concern I have uh, connecting this to civil liberties is that uh, the problem becomes if you have... Um, if you have a serology test, if you have an antigen test that is not reliable, that gives you essentially a false positive, for example, and you wind up having an electronic contract, uh, contact tracing system, that is going to give the false impression that you or others around you have been exposed. That's exactly the kind of thing that we want to stay away from. Uh, so we really need to get uh, the, the science behind this and the medical aspects of this, the testing aspect of this right, before we really talk about trying to layer on additional technology. The additional and, and perhaps you know, overarching civil liberties concern here is that as a general rule, when the government uh, starts a program designed to collect data, whether it is the government doing it itself or whether it is using uh, corporate proxies like Apple, Google, et cetera, to do it, um, they almost never get rid of the data. <laughs> uh, and so you, you get into the situation where you can wind up having the government potentially collecting uh, an awful lot of very sensitive personal information on folks from a health standpoint. And I think we do have to be very concerned about that. Now, the, the, the health aspect of this and the, um, the, the concerns about contact tracing and all the rest of that, of course, are just a slice of the overall problem we're dealing with. Uh, I, I think what I've also found very disturbing are these reports uh, essentially of governors basically issuing orders uh, telling uh, people of faith uh, that they can't go to church and so on and so forth. As far as I'm concerned, that is in fact a direct head-on assault uh, on religious freedom. I don't think there's really any question about that. Having said that, given the public health concern, I don't think there's any question that there are some middle grounds here that can be achieved. So for, I'll just give this as an example. Um, in a lot of places in this country, of course, we have softball fields, we have soccer fields, we have football stadiums, et cetera, et cetera. These are places where open air services could be conducted utilizing the social distancing and mask wearing protocols that have been suggested by the federal government and that many localities are essentially now you know, trying to mandate, many of which have actually mandated it. So in my judgment, there's absolutely a way to allow folks to go and actually worship uh, in their preferred ma manner, uh, while still maintaining a margin of safety, both for themselves and, and for others. So I, I really do fault a lot of uh, state and local officials for not being terribly sensitive to this and not being creative about it, quite frankly, uh, because this has created, I think, an awful lot of prospect for uh, civil liberties related litigation. Uh, and I think it's also simply strained relationships in communities, uh, all of which ultimately could have been avoided. So I, I worry about that aspect of it. Uh, and then going forward, I, I think I also share a lot of the concerns that, that many have about any kind of potential role for the American military in this. You know, I think it's great uh, that they mobilized the, the USNS Comfort and sent her up to, to New York City to try to help out. I don't think that was handled as well as it could have been, but that kind of military support role. So for example, you know, mobilizing uh, guard and reserve hospital, mobile hospital units, um, 
even mobilizing civil affairs units, things of that nature to provide additional support and capacity uh, for doing some of these things that we need to have done. I, I have no problem with that. I think that would actually be a good utilization of existing resources. What we don't need to have is the kind of, of militarized response and heavy handed police response that we've begun to see in a number of cities. I'm sure pretty much everybody has probably seen the video of Philadelphia cops dragging that guy uh, off of that bus uh, in Philly. Uh, he was not wearing a mask. That was not wise. There's no question about that. It was not respectful of his fellow citizens. No doubt in my mind about that. But that entire incident, I think, just underscored the danger of all of this. And then, of course, in North Carolina, just a couple of days ago, uh, we had the Raleigh police uh, tweet, essentially, that uh, protesting is a, quote, non-essential activity, end quote. Uh, that sparked a very appropriate backlash. Um, I, I certainly think that the founders of this country would vehemently disagree that protest uh, uh, is, is uh, not non-essential, it absolutely is essential. And we can't have those kinds of things happening uh, here as well. So I, I think um, we're going to have to be on guard throughout this crisis for several things. The first is the effort to try to uh, utilize electronic forms of mass surveillance in, in various guises uh, to try to actually locate people uh, who may be infected instead of using traditional proven medical methodologies for doing that. Uh, starting, of course, with absolutely reliable testing to begin with. And I think we also have to be very concerned about uh, what we're seeing in, in terms of these enforced stay-at-home orders, uh, assaults essentially on freedom of worship uh, and, and assembly uh, in ways that are not being handled responsibly, not being handled effectively. And then finally, I think uh, we have to be concerned about the long term. You know, this, this crisis, we are going to set, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we're going to, one moment. We're going to be setting a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of precedents here that we should be very, very concerned about. And I think I'll cut it off there for now. Thank you very much for that, Pat. I think that's a really good segue into Alex. Um, I, I, I know Alex knows this, but I'll just tell the audience, one of the things that Defending Rights and Dissent has been most concerned about is that why we uh, recognize these stay-at-home orders as legitimate or legitimate public health measures when you get police involved, it starts to raise very troubling questions about what 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 role should they have in this at all. So I guess I will give it to Alex to tell us if police have a role in the coronavirus response at all, and if not, what should we be doing? Thanks, uh, Chip, and uh, thanks to uh, Drat. I didn't know that was the proper. Uh, Drat, <laughs> okay, and the Nation for for sponsoring this, and uh, really glad to be on the panel with everyone. And actually, I want to just start by riffing off something that uh, that Ken raised, right? Which was this question about the appropriate use of the military. And of course, we're in an emergency situation. The military exists in the form that it exists in. We can't change that in this instantaneous moment. But there is a kind of lesson here, right? Which is that in a crisis at the national level, what kind of elastic resource do we have to throw at the problem? And in the US in this moment, that elastic resource is the military. And so we begin to say things like, don't use military at the border to, to escalate tensions there, use them in an aid role to provide medical support and material logistics, et cetera, which I, of course, totally agree with. But you can see the kind of perversity of that situation. And I actually uh, wrote a piece for Fortune magazine a couple of years ago after the one of the many episodes of horrible flooding down in Houston where I talked about the fact that the, the federal 1099 program that makes sur surplus military hardware available to police, it has engendered this huge development of police military technology, but there are no swift water rescue boats. There are not enough helicopters to do these kinds of adequate emergency response capabilities. So you end up 
relying on the Cajun Navy and volunteer efforts, which are fantastic and amazing and should be supported as I'll talk about in a second. But of course we have the analogous situation when it comes to policing, which is that cities have so degraded their public health capabilities. And I'm not just talking about hospitals, but a robust public health capacity would be the ability to go out into communities to work with people on improving health outcomes. This is not just about doctors and nurses, it's about disease control investigators, it's about people doing daily observed therapy for, for people who need to take daily medications, it's about making sure people have adequate nutrition and a whole host of interventions, including health inspections and whatnot. But we've so degraded that capacity that in a crisis, what tool do local leaders have? the police. But the police are not very well suited for this. And of course, local elected officials like Mayor de Blasio, but really this is a national problem, right? They view certain communities in particular as being sort of always already suspect, always already not to be trusted, needing to be tightly managed and controlled through threats and coercive interventions. And so police are used not uniformly in all places, right? The police do not behave the same way in every neighborhood because they've been told that certain communities are sources of problem and will only understand these kinds of coercive and punitive interventions. So when we turn the problem over to police, we are automatically bringing in a system of unequal police intervention so that the interventions don't look the same in different places. And so what we see, right, is not white middle-class people being tackled in parks for playing Frisbee too close to each other. What we see is mostly people of color being tackled on public transit, trying to get to their necessary jobs in many cases. And we've even had children of color, right, uh, tackled by, by police here in, in New York City. So when we use this police resource, we're going to get uneven and unjust uh, outcomes from this. We're asking police, for instance, to make determinations of who constitutes a household. So there was one image that was circulating from New York where a mixed race couple was sitting together and to the police officer, this meant that these two people obviously couldn't be in the same household. And so they were ordered to separate even though they lived together. So when so policing, while there's a necessity to have stay-at-home orders and there's a necessity for the state to try to maximize compliance, the decision to use the police that rely primarily on threats and coercion to accomplish their goals means that you're going to have deeply problematic and in, in many cases, racial, racially problematic, racist outcomes. So what's the alternative? I and mean, that's really then what we're left with because we, we accept in some ways the legitimacy of the mission, we're questioning the tools that are being used. Well, what exactly is it that we're concerned about? We're concerned about social distancing, yes, but I think a lot of mayors are concerned about more than that. They're concerned about civil unrest. They're concerned about the potential for things to get out of hand. In New York, de Blasio, I think, resisted closing the schools, for instance, for an extended period of time. And he basically said this because he's concerned about high school kids in poor communities being unsupervised during the day. And he's like, what are they going to get into? What trouble are they going to cause? Right? It's that fundamental distrust he has of these young people and, and of, frankly, of these communities. Well, the fact is, is that de Blasio is not trusted in a lot of these places. And when he gets on television and says, we have to do X, Y, and Z for public health purposes, everyone doesn't just immediately fall into line because de Blasio said it. I think it's easier maybe for some of us watching today to just take note of the fact that when Trump says, go do X, Y, and Z, we don't just automatically fall into line and do whatever Trump says. We harbor a deep skepticism about anything that Trump says, even when there are some scientists and medical professionals up there. 
I mean, the reality is for many communities of color, they not only distrust these elected officials, there's a distrust of the medical establishment, especially for African-Americans. You know, the memories of the Tuskegee experiment and other ways in which African-Americans have been systematically mistreated by the American medical system makes them reluctant to just accept at face value an order to stay home and not interact with other people. So what do you do about that? Well, why is it that the only voices we hear talking about the importance of social distancing are these elected officials occasionally backed up by some medical professionals? Well, where are the community voices? You know, one of the lessons that has been learned in a crystal clear way in the public health community is that public health messaging has to be done on a kind of peer-to-peer and culturally appropriate way. That one message for everyone is not gonna work, that we have to tailor the message to different audiences, and that when we involve people from communities in the messaging, compliance improves dramatically. This is how tremendous progress was made on the AIDS front within the gay community. And this is how we should be handling the COVID-19 problem. Where are the voices of community leaders talking about social distancing? They're not being put on the radio by the mayor's office. They're not being put on television. They're not being encouraged to be a source of local information, right? The mayor, the governor, and the president want to use this spotlight to enhance their own images, to look like they're this commanding presence and then to criminalize those people who don't trust them and don't necessarily comply in the ways that they recommend. So they rely on policing essentially to back up a political project of shining up their image as being in charge and take charge. Instead, we need to decentralize this process. We need to give communities more of a role in this. We need to respect the differences of different communities and the legacies of distrust that come with that and we've got to build compliance from the ground up. And that does not comport with just turning it all over to the police. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. That was a really great presentation. And now we're going to go to Sarah. And then after that, we'll open it up for audience questions and maybe a few questions for myself. And if panelists have questions for other panelists, we can just do that as well. Sarah, you're muted. Uh, can you hear me now? Sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, Dred. Thanks to the nation for organizing this event. Um, so I want to start by noting that any discussion of rights or freedom must start with the principle of radical equality this idea that we all matter equally, regardless of national origin. If our concern as people in the US is providing immediate relief and support for all people harmed and threatened by coronavirus, regardless of national origin or residence, a good step is to stop the US military from perpetrating the harm that it's presently inflicting against people who are highly vulnerable to the outbreak. And I think any discussion of sort of how the US is mobilizing the military at this moment, if it's not looking internationally, is violating the principle of radical equality. Um, so I just want to note a few different things happening around the world that the US military is doing that is making the outbreak far worse, both for those people living there and also the entire world, because the pandemic is a global pandemic. So an outbreak anywhere affects the entire world. So we've seen five years of a US-Saudi war and blockade on Yemen. It's left that country's medical system completely decimated. The US cut aid to Yemen, um, where there now is officially COVID-19. And US-Saudi bombings have continued throughout the pandemic. So why are calls for an immediate end to US participation in that war and not considered a high priority emergency response? How come that's not what we talk about when we talk about the US military's role right now in the middle of the pandemic? Um, in Iran, you know, when we fortify the military, when we talk about using the military for crisis response, 
were in fact reinforcing the larger imperial apparatus it's a part of. Um, the Trump administration acts on behalf of this imperial apparatus to tighten US sanctions on Iran in the midst of a pandemic, despite warning that those sanctions are cutting off needed medical supplies and increasing co coronavirus deaths. Um, the US also deployed aircraft carriers near Iran in late March, um, a significant escalation not long after Trump almost started an overt direct war with Iran, um, which would have been escalation from the ongoing proxy wars. Um, why isn't ending these sanctions considered a top priority in the fight against coronavirus? We can look to Venezuela. The U.S. sent Navy ships to the Caribbean to hedge against Venezuela, which is already suffering a brutal sanctions regime that is estimated to have killed 40,000 people from 2017 to 2018, according to the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Um, where is the urgency around lifting those sanctions? U.S. military aid is enabling Israel's 14-year economic and military siege of Gaza, one of the most densely populated places in the world um, where, where there is now confirmed coronavirus. It has a population of 2 million people. It only has dozens of ventilators. Why isn't it considered a top priority for the United States to withdraw its military aid from the siege so that life-saving medicines and supplies can get through? Um, we're, you know, we've seen that mounting U.S. escalation towards China has led to a profound lack of cooperation that quite likely has made the pandemic far worse than it ha had to be. I, I think it's a fair statement to say that anti-China nationalism has made the pandemic far worse and eroded international cooperation. And then now we see that the US military is seeking more funding, $20.1 billion to counter China in the Asia Pacific region in 2021 and after. So any discussion of rights and liberties in the context of the US military must start with the urgent need for the US to remove its boot from the neck of the rest of the world. It's not a mystery what's going to happen if US military oppression continues during the pandemic. The science is a science, people will die. Uh, people are dying right now. By failing to take immediate steps to stop the harm that it's doing in the midst of the pandemic, the US will bear responsibility for those deaths. But the problem is, um, as Alex pointed out, that the discussion of the US military in the context of a crisis really only ever goes in one direction, and that's the direction of pouring more resources into the military. I think many of us saw that on March 18th, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio went on CNN and he pleaded for President Trump to mobilize the US military in response to coronavirus. He said, I want their medical teams, which are first rate. I want their logistical support. I want their ability to get stuff from factories all over the country where they're needed most. He said this to Anderson Cooper. And he said the only force in America that can do it effectively and quickly is the US military. Um, calls for heavy US military involvement have come from across the political spectrum, um, including entities like the Koch funded Heritage Foundation. Um, and we are seeing the military being deployed. So the Military Times reported on April 8th that more than um, 28,000 Air and Army National Guard have been mobilized across the country um, with 21 states, two territories in the District of Columbia and now having been approved for the use of federal funds for state missions. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people have rightfully pointed out that undoubtedly people are desperate. There's a dearth of large scale institutions capable of converting abandoned bridges and, or sorry, capable of converting abandoned buildings into hospitals or quickly distributing tests, uh, medical supplies, food, um, all acts that will be necessary um, to deal with the um, rise in coronavirus patients and the economic downturn that we're facing. Um, mayors and governors very well may feel like they have nowhere else to turn but the US military. However, this reflects a profound failure of our political system. The US military is not a public health organization. It is a purveyor of wars, occupations, and proxy battles with 800 military bases around the world. In each of those places, it brings pollution. It undermines local self-determination. It uh, is often associated with higher rates of sexual assault. And there are people all over the world who, are, who have been protesting US military presence for decades and would want to see the military go. Um, so, you know, when we talk about um, when we talk about turning to the military in a moment like this, we have to think about the holistic effect. This is not just something that happens domestically. 
The U.S. military is the largest military empire that has ever existed in all of human history. It is all over the world. So we have to think about the world when we're talking about the mobilization of the U.S. military. Um, so we've seen some disturbing signs uh, that some uh, officials are trying to mobilize the military in the service of law enforcement. Um, New Jersey Attorney General said on April 6th, um, you know, that they're establishing a division of criminal justice for military police officers and security personnel in the National Guard to ensure they're prepared if called upon to perform law enforcement duties. Um, and then we saw um, earlier on March 17th, uh, uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom publicly float the possibility of imposing martial law, a statement that he later walked back. Um, and, you know, I've spoken with uh, activists in various places who sort of center uh, anti-militarism in their work and they're watching closely and they're monitoring and they're worried. Um, one thing that I think we should, that it's really important to remember during all of this is that there's a long history of Black Lives Matter protesting the ways that the US military brutalizes and militarizes domestic policing. Um, I think many of us remember that one of the key demands of the Black Lives Matter movement was to stop the militarization of police through the 1033 program that allows the military to donate surplus equipment to police, which is why uh, police forces have tanks and things like that. We have every reason to be concerned about the US military policing the streets of the United States. Um, you know, uh, the US military is prone to punitive responses at a time that people are at their most vulnerable and desperately need food and rent money. Uh, we, we saw this in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina when the National Guard was deployed to New Orleans and took a, an incredibly brutal punitive law enforcement role. So, um, some anti-militarist organizers have offered interesting ways forward or interesting solutions. Um, in late March, Phyllis Bennis and the Reverend uh, Barber wrote a piece that argued, to, um, I'm quoting them, to fight this pandemic, we need to take over the military's resources and not the other way around. So they argued for a civilian takeover of the military so that it can be entirely repurposed. They said that if, if the military is going to be used to distribute um, medicine and food and provide health care that has to be entirely under civilian control. One thing to consider is that a lot of very vulnerable people, just like they're afraid of police, are also going to be afraid of, you know, uh, National Guard members who are in military uniform. If you're undocumented, if you've spent time in prison, if you come from a community that's heavily policed, uh, that might be enough to get you, or to steer you away from showing up to get food aid and things like that. Um, so the fact that we are turning to the military in this moment for crisis response shows that as a country, our government's default posture is one of militarism, um, relying on the Department of Defense to perform duties that should be run by civilians. Um, at the bare minimum, so I'm not prepared to sort of make a case for what it is or isn't appropriate. Um, for the military to be repurposed for or not in this time. I think that's a really complex discussion, but I will say it's very, very alarming to not see even much debate or discussion in public forums about what it would mean for communities here in the US, um, what kind of violence people could face, what kind of oppression, um, how we could protect against that. So to, to not even see that kind of conversation is really concerning to me. And it tells me that our default position is turning to militarism for activities that should be run by civilians. So over the long term, we absolutely must change the state of affairs. Um, after all, the coronavirus crisis is not the only crisis that we face. Um, but, you know, if, if things continue as is, we will face a climate crisis. When we begin to feel the worst effects, are we just going to hand the country over to unelected military brass? Um, each time there's a drought or a superstorm. Are we going to expand the security state while shrinking the welfare state? Um, I would argue that what we need is the exact opposite. We need to be chipping away at the security state. I think what we're seeing right now is that regardless of what we've been told, the military doesn't make us safer. Overall, holistically, if you look at the whole world, it's making the world a far more dangerous place when what we need is civilian run 
efforts based in care and solidarity to get people fed, to, to catch the millions of people in free fall right now. Um, you know, 20, more than 20 million people over the past several weeks have filed for unemployment. They need expanded universal social goods. They need services, they need care. They don't need the expansion of the security state. What we need is the expansion of the welfare state. We need to be ch chipping away at the security state. Um, we are seeing right now that despite what we've been told, it does not make us safe to have a bloated security state. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. And we're going to go to audience questions in just a minute. Uh, we are surprisingly running nine minutes ahead of schedule, um, which I think this is the first panel I've ever been on that was running ahead of schedule and not behind. Uh, one thing that I was neglectful during my introduction, I had intended to mention, but was reminded of when Sarah was talking, so I want to bring this up now, is how disturbing the rise in xenophobia has been in this moment. We know that the federal government has entirely botched its response. And what we're seeing is a lot of people in the federal government, the president included, engaged in this very sort of xenophobic and racist scapegoating in order to distract from their own failures. And this has led to an uptick in hate crimes against Asian Americans. It's, it's extremely disturbing. The, the very first statement Defending Rights and Dissent put out on the coronavirus was on March 18th, 2020, and it was titled, uh, Responding to the Coronavirus Requires Transparency, Not Xenophobia, which was sort of a response to two very disturbing trends we saw. One was how the Trump administration was not being transparent, which surprise, surprise, but also using this to double down on secrecy and also the outpouring of, of xenophobia that I found, uh, we all found very disturbing. Um, I'm about to go to audience questions, but I have a question for all of the panelists. Um, I'm sorry if this is putting you a bit on the spot. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, but it, it came to me when I was listening to everyone. We've talked a lot about what types of responses to the coronavirus we don't want to see. Policing, immigrant detention, use of the military. And I realized none of you came prepared for this question. What's the type of response to the coronavirus you would actually like to see the US government engage in? And I recognize there is like everyone from people at Cato to democratic socialists on this panel. So there probably will not be a uh, unified agreement, but I I'm just curious if anyone wants to tackle that question. Shutting down prisons and immigration detention centers. And I think this is a really, um, you know, opportune moment for all of us who have been organizing for abolition for a long time to keep pushing, uh, where we know that keeping people imprisoned and holed up in these spaces is actually gonna lead um, to people dying. And so that's not a fact that the US government can escape for much longer. Uh, that's an excellent point. And I just, I just want to go to Alex because while we're all really disturbed at what's happening, there have been a lot of activists who have been making sort of radical demands around decarceration, around, around decreasing, and they really sort of have the public health imperative on their side. Could you sort of talk about, about that? Well, well, first, I think an, another thing we should be talking about is uh, something like universal basic income, which we're, we're seeing Spain moving to implement and, and other parts of Europe actively discussing so I think that this crisis has pointed out the need to explore something along those lines. I'm not an expert on, on the details of that and thinking about some of the potential unintended consequences, but something that should be looked at. And decarceration, you know, is got to be an essential element, but we have to be careful because decarceration without corresponding community investments could be a problem. We've got a situation here in New York where we're releasing people from Rikers into homelessness, into a shelter system that is maybe just as, and in some cases more dangerous than the jail system. So this has been, I think, a little bit of a challenge for some of the decarceration activists is that they, they're, they're working very hard to get people out of these institutions, but they're somehow imagining that 
bringing them back to the community is all a, po a positive for, for that individual or the community. So where are the resources to make sure that people are able to live in a stable, stable way? For instance, with the outbreak widespread in many jails and prisons, bringing those people back to their homes may actually be endangering their families. So are there transition places where people can safely quarantine in decent conditions? That needs to be established, right? In addition to the, the broader needs of the decarceration mo movement to look at things like mass homelessness and inadequate health care, substance abuse treatment, et cetera, that, that are needed to help stabilize people upon, upon release. So I will give tremendous credit, right, to the, to the organizing that's been done to pressure those people who could be dramatically reducing prison and jail populations and really pointing out the, the imperative of doing that at this time, which I, which I fully support. And uh, it's been a really broad kind of coalition of groups uh, pu pushing the needle on this effort. Um, I just wanna jump in and say, um, there are a lot of formerly incarcerated people calling right now for people to be released from prison and mass and also to be provided everything they need to survive once they're out. So housing, you know, social supports, food. Um, there's a group called First Followers in Urbana, Illinois, and uh, one of their organized, so they're a re-entry program led by formerly incarcerated people aimed at supporting people once they're out on the outside. And one of their organizers, James Kilgore, was really hammering this point hard. And I think that that's a really important one. Um, but yeah, we absolutely need to free people from prison. I mean, I think that the the claim that, well, it's more dangerous for them to leave prison is something that we're seeing, uh, for example, the Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart saying as justification to people locked in Cook County Jail, which is now uh, the biggest COVID-19 hotspot in the entire country, an absolute petri dish for this lethal virus. So to think that keeping people in that prison, that jail is somehow safer is a really ridiculous position and is something that I think the sheriff is using to cover his own tracks. Um, just a few other things, you know, I, I think that the solution right now is uh, sort of the immediate creation of broad socialistic universal programs um, to rapidly construct safety, safety nets for people who are, you know, free falling, uh, who have nothing to catch them and who are about to, or already are crashing to the pavement. You know, I think, uh, you know, mobilizing trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to get to get large cash payments every single month. Um, you know, repurpose hotels, corporate boardrooms to house people who don't have don't have houses to live in, to house people um, being let out of prison. Ideally, um, we need to um, we need to absolutely dismantle the US military. Uh, I think that, I, but, but I think there are a lot of emergency, emergency measures that need to happen right now. Um, and, you know, one of the things is uh, one of the only contexts that, they, that the US has for compelling industry to do anything is in the context of war. You know, there's a lot of reliance on the Defense Production Act to make things like ventilators. I think over the long term, it would be really great to have other tools for compelling industry to do things that aren't relying on war. And so over the long term, I think that hopefully this moment in time raises a lot of questions about um, what it would look like to really take to heart the, the bold uh, universal programs that we need uh, moving forward and really make us question um, the way our society is organized right now. Uh, thank you, sir. Do any of the other panelists want to weigh in on how they would like to see the response look like? <clears throat> I'll, I'll just say that I think if, if this crisis has shown anything, it has shown the very real limits of government at the end of the day. And it starts with um, having people at the top who are actually competent at the job, who actually are paying attention uh, to, to the crisis as it unfolds. You know, we, we were clearly getting some warnings about this, uh, this potential problem back in November uh, from the Defense Intelligence Agency, from what I've been able to gather uh, about the problems at Wuhan. And we also know from the Washington Post reporting 
that the State Department itself, uh, who had folks who had been to uh, the Wuhan area, had real concerns about uh, the lab there itself and, and whether or not they were actually successfully uh, operating in a genuinely safe, uh, safe manner. Whether that means that we are dealing with a situation in which some kind of uh, viral organism made its way out of a BL level four lab, you know, we don't know. And, that, and that's because in the case of China, communist China, we're dealing with a totalitarian system. Uh, we, you know, we had, uh, we had reporting earlier today, in fact, talking about uh, the reality that the Chinese communist leadership basically tried to put the lid on this whole thing for at least a week uh, before anybody had a clue that anything was going on there. So I, I, I think when we talk about, um, you know, trying to prevent something like this from happening in the future, uh, we need governments everywhere to be willing to be transparent on these issues uh, and to provide as much information at the outset in an open and honest way if we're going to have a chance of, of uh, defeating anything like this in the future. Secondly, I would say that what this crisis has demonstrated is that um, the emphasis that we have had for the last nearly 20 years uh, on terrorism and counterterrorism has, has been misplaced. I think probably everybody who is on this panel uh, would agree with that. And if there's anything that ought to come out of this in terms of an overall restructuring uh, of our approach uh, to what constitutes a genuine security threat to the United States, it, it ought to be an understanding that a virus like this is the ultimate threat to, to public health and to public safety and to the economy of the United States. So I, I do think that we need to have a fundamental reevaluation uh, of, of what we perceive to be a threat. What is an actual threat? What is something that can really do damage? I mean, if you stop and think about it, uh, sadly, you know, we've easily passed uh, the 30,000 dead point uh, for this particular virus. Um, that's, that's half the number of folks killed in this country in about three months. Uh, as we lost in the entire 14 years of the or 10 years, 10 plus years of the Vietnam War. So we do need to have a, a refocusing, I think, uh, essentially looking at uh, our overall healthcare system. Uh, I would make the argument, and I think a lot of folks would make the argument, that the FDA and others got in the way here. Uh, CDC got in the way. Um, there has not been enough innovation. Um, there has been too much regulation. To, to prevent uh, manufacturers from being able to get things out quickly. That doesn't mean that we should abandon uh, proper validation. As I said in my opening remarks, one of the concerns that I have is that we've got maybe too many potential tests out there right now uh, that are being marketed, possibly without proper validation. So we've got to get to a place where we, we have a proper balance between the necessary regulation to ensure public health and safety when it comes to testing, drugs, biologics, vaccines, et cetera, but at the same time, ensuring that we can have a much faster response uh, in the future. And I, I think everybody's going to wind up having some lessons learned coming out of this. And, and, I'll, and I'll just say, as someone who spent a lot of time uh, in the military and has spent a lot of time uh, around folks uh, in the military, um, it, it's rare that governments, as a general rule, do a very good job of planning uh, for for the next catastrophe. We have a, a tendency, unfortunately, to basically look backwards. You know, I think we've done a lot of that. And if we're going to get our act together going forward to meet this kind of public health threat, it is going to ultimately take public-private partnerships along the lines of what they had in South Korea. If you look at the South Korean model, you know, they learned the right lessons from what happened to them uh, with MERS in 2015. Um, you know, 90% of their overall healthcare infrastructure is in private hands. Um, and they, they learned the proper lessons uh, from what happened in 2015. And they were able to get this mass testing out precisely because they had established a system that made it all possible to begin with. So I think that's, that's the place when we talk about dealing with pandemics going forward, because <clears throat> I, I doubt seriously, this will be the last one that we face. We need to look carefully at what the South Koreans did and see how much of their lessons learned we can actually import here. And then finally, I'll just echo what I think others have, uh, several others have said so far, which is the last thing that we need right now is a hyper-militarized response. I, and I just want to make a quick comment on, on one particular incident. You know, a few weeks ago, the governor of New Hampshire uh, issued an order 
to our state police to stop anybody with New York plates essentially from coming into the state. Um, that was idiotic on multiple levels. It just wasn't bad from a civil liberty standpoint, uh, but it was bad from an epidemiological standpoint. You know, if somebody who was sick, uh, a New York resident happened to be coming from Connecticut, driving a rental vehicle that didn't have New York plates, that meant you had a vector going on there. But it's that kind of fear-based response that often leads to these overreaches that we see. And I think that's what, if we're gonna push back against anything, that's what we have to be pushing back against in the short to medium term. Um, and I think that's it for me for now. So clearly a very diverse range of, of opinions on, on what a uh, appropriate response would look like. Do anyone who hasn't spoken want to weigh in just yet? If not, there are audience questions for specific panelists, mostly Sarah, apparently, but um, don't look, <laughs> you look surprised. Um, but any, any, any thoughts on, on that? Okay, so Sarah, someone wants you to explain a little bit more what happened in New Orleans that you referenced. And somebody else asked if you see parallels between what's happening in Kent State. Um, yeah, those are, those are very good questions. Um, so I'm actually not an expert on sort of the post Katrina, um, uh, highly militarized response. Um, but I will just say I spent a little bit of time, um, for an article that I was doing, um, on this topic, looking at old newspaper clippings from sort of around that time. Um, and um, I saw that uh, there were um, tons of complaints from people in New Orleans, especially Black people who said that they found the um, policing presence um, far more punitive than helpful. I saw in particular, I just found a contemporaneous New York Times article um, that went into some detail about that. I was actually wondering, Alex, if that's something in your field of expertise that you could speak to at all. Well, you know, the, the policing in New, New Orleans was so problematic before Katrina that, that as with a lot of this, right, it just, it just highlights the existing problems. And so, you know, the irony was that, that people were much happier to see military troops than the NOPD on the streets because they at least, you know, they felt like maybe there was some possibility that those folks, you know, weren't the enemy that they knew. That was a source of so much trouble. Uh, you know, the policing was so bad that something like 20% of officers just walked off the job and never came back in the middle of the storm. You know, and of course there were officers con uh, convicted of extrajudicial killings during the during the hurricane, and it was it was a real mess. Now, of course, you know, I think the overall story about Katrina was a kind of disaster capitalism story, right, where they used that to remake the school system, land use policy, the, the whole nine yards. I, you know, there, there's one other thing I want to say that's a really um, sort of horrific uh, uh, sort of parallel with what happened in New Orleans, which is, um, so what happened in New Orleans is that people were left to die and disproportionately black people and disproportionately poor people um, and we're seeing the same thing now. Um, all of the data shows that Black people are dying disproportionately more. Um, data shows that if you're poor, you're far less likely to be tested. Um, and, um, you know, when Republicans or when CEOs say it's time to send everyone back to work now, we really want to make sure that we're not losing any of our profits. Um, it's very, we have to be, it's very important to be clear about whose lives they think should be sacrificed for the GDP or for their, you know, Wall Street buddies' bottom lines. They're talking about African American people disproportionately dying, and they're talking about poor people. Um, and so, just as we saw in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, what we're seeing now is people being left to die. And instead of responding with compassionate, universal systems that can catch everyone who's falling, um, that can, that can, you know, that are rooted in the idea that um, people matter and it's not okay to let them die. Um, and that, and that work to rec rectify the many forms of racism, you know, we're seeing both, both uh, 
socioeconomic racism playing out and who has pre-existing conditions, who has access to health care. But then we're also seeing that uh, essential workers are disproportionately people of color and they're the ones who are on the front line. So instead of instead of responding with care to those realities, what we're seeing is um, a response that is punitive. Um, so that's one um, disturbing parallel. Um, so in terms of whether uh, there are sort of parallels to draw with Kent State, um, you know, I think that in general, we should be very worried about any deployment of US military forces anywhere, um, whether that's here in the US or whether that's anywhere in the world. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we haven't seen anything like what happened regarding Kent State um, yet with respect to the National Guard, but we are seeing um, police and jailers and sheriffs and city officials and town officials playing a horrific role right now, locking people in prisons and jails. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, I'm gonna take the next question in a minute, but I've been asked to reintroduce the panel briefly. So I'm Chip Gibbons, Policy Director of Defending Rights and Dissent, uh, Defending Rights and Dissent, along with The Nation Magazine, are co-sponsoring this. We're joined by Sarah Lazar, web editor of In These Times, Alex Vitale, author of The End of Policing, Azadeh Shashahani of Project South, and formerly the National Lawyers Guild, also renowned human rights lawyer, Patrick Eddington, Cato, former Rush Holt staffer, uh, expert on surveillance, and Ken Klippenstein, uh, the DC correspondent for The Nation magazine. Uh, Ken, you have a question, and it's, is the administration going to retain any of the data from their Google Facebook tracking partnership? Um, I think that might be a better question for someone else. I'm, I'm not okay. as familiar with that. All right, then. Um, does anyone else have thoughts on that? If not, I can go to the next question, which is for Azadeh. Well, so, so I think um, at this point in time, it, it's really unclear exactly how far the administration will, will necessarily try to go with this. You know, Trump, of course, not even two days ago, was asserting, quote, total authority to order a, uh, an opening of the government. Of course, he has no constitutional authority whatsoever to do that. that that's strictly up to the states and localities. Um, I, I do think that uh, on the basis of what Google and Apple have said publicly so far, any system that they try to get off the ground will not be remotely ready for prime time until the fall, more than likely. Uh, so the entire landscape is likely to be very different then. But I do think that in a general context, we should be very concerned about you know this emergency situation uh, leading politicians in both parties, basically, to look for an opportunity to try to take their, their favorite pet surveillance projects uh, and, and get them uh, you know, inserted in, into uh, must-pass legislation. I think that's what I, I'm personally very concerned about. Um, we're hearing folks at the Department of Justice already whining about the so-called lapse uh, of Patriot Act authorities that occurred uh, last month. The reality is uh, any orders that were issued under that uh, are still valid uh, and collection is still capable you know, under uh, other authorities such as Executive Order uh, 12333. So I, I do think we have to be on guard against that kind of thing, but how far the White House, you know, will try to take this, um, I think only time will tell. And, and just for some, some background, uh, 215 of the Patriot Act was set to expire in November. The House renewed it um, in part of a must-pass spending resolution. And then there was more concern, and Pat can talk better about this than I can, there was more concern that in one of the COVID relief bills, they were going to sneak Patriot Act reauthorization into it. And what about Patriot Act reauthorization concerns you, Pat, for people who might not be familiar with this? Well, you know, the, when, we started you, out, but... when we started out with this legislation um, uh, that was passed six weeks after the 9-11 attacks, uh, absolutely no examination of why those attacks had succeeded had even been conducted yet, right? So Congress literally passed uh, a huge bill with uh, over 150 provisions in it that uh, we had no reason to believe uh, would actually necessarily stop anything. It was kind of a wish list, essentially, uh, of provisions that a number of Department of Justice officials, prior attorney generals and, and the current attorney general at the time, uh, we're very eager to have. 
Uh, and, you know, once you actually got into the 2002 uh, era and, and, the, and the Congress uh, actually did the Congressional Joint Inquiry, looked into why 9-11 happened, uh, it was kind of the same old story. Uh, the intelligence community and federal law enforcement dropped the ball, which is exactly what uh, the 9-11 Commission would find two years later. So it was a power grab, you know, and kind of the- Can you explain what 215 is though, the, the provision that's- sure. uh, well. Section 215 of the Patriot Not Act- I don't want to hear the whole history of the Patriot Act, but we have 15 minutes. Right. So, so simply stated, Section 215 uh, of the Patriot Act is what's known as the business records provision. This is the provision that gives the Department of Justice the ability to go to an Amazon or a Home Depot or whoever uh, and essentially demand records on things that you or the subject of a particular investigation uh, have asked for. It also got known as the library records provision uh, and the American Library Association uh, very justifiably uh, went after the FBI and DOJ on this uh, precisely because it seemed to be a repeat of a program uh, that the Reagan administration and the Bush 41 administration uh, had run uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s called the so-called library awareness program. And again, this is going after essentially records of things that people have read and so on and so forth. So it, it's a broad provision. It's very sweeping. Uh, it is not generally subject to the same kind of Fourth Amendment probable cause uh, related standard that, that we'd like to see with, with, uh, with warrants that are issued. Uh, there are two other provisions uh, that, that the uh, surveillance hawks were fighting for. One, the so-called lone wolf provision uh, has never even been used. So there was real, literally no reason to go ahead uh, and reauthorize it. And then the other one is, is the roving wiretap provision, which I do think has you know, potentially some utility. But at the same time, without adequate safeguards, it's exactly the kind of thing that can be, abu uh, be abused very, very easily. And, so that's, and, kind of the, that's the general context for, for that. And 215 was used by the NSA to justify its bulk sort of collection of metadata program. That's correct. The, the, program, uh, the program that Edward Snowden uh, exposed in June of 2013. That's and there was some concern since they had already snuck this into the continuing resolution that they might put it in the coronavirus bill, but leadership I quickly publicly disavowed that uh, for people who aren't following this, uh, the House did not reauthorize it permanently before going on recess. They did a 76 day temporary clean reauthorization, which is viewed by, by some as a temporary victory for surveillance or privacy hawks as opposed to the surveillance hawks. Um, so we have a question from Azadeh or for Azadeh, not from her. Could you explain more what is happening to refugees at the border? Well, um, so the U.S.-Mexico border has been shut down. Um, there has been a um, basically sustained attack on asylum seekers for a long time by the Trump administration. And um, the pandemic has basically provided them the opportunity to further uh, resort to uh, xenophobia and a scapegoat um, immigrants and asylum seekers. And so um, you know, asylum seekers at the border have been in a state of limbo for a long time, unfortunately. And um, for the foreseeable future, it looks like they're going to uh, basically stay in that state. Sure. And then we have a question for Ken. Um, could many of these overreaching measures have measures been prevented if the Trump administration had acted earlier? Are we being compromised because of their incompetence? Oh, absolutely. Um, he acted uh, quite late. Uh, he had, uh, someone else pointed out, indications from the Defense Intelligence Agency, um, our intelligence community obviously collects a ton of information and <laughs> that's a whole nother debate in itself. But the fact that they had uh, indications going back as early as December um, and January uh, are, are very clear. And that's really when things needed to kick in. Um, you know, while Lay persons may not be aware, uh, certainly I wasn't, of what a bio threat response would look like, what a pandemic response would look like. Uh, he certainly had people in his administration giving him president, daily presidential briefings, um, notifying him of this and you know themselves quite aware of it. Again, the Pentagon was quite aware of um, not just the threat of something like this, the likelihood, but also um, the course of action that it would need to take uh, to, to ameliorate it. Um, they understood that social distancing, and there are documents now that I've published to that effect, um, showing that um, they anticipated a sh you know, shortage of personal protective equipment, uh, shortages of hospital beds, the need for um, adequate, not just resources, but logistics to deliver them um, on every conceivable level they understood what was going to happen. So 
um, either Trump, uh, you know, wasn't paying attention when this stuff was presented to him or he um, was and he just didn't care. I, I can only speculate, but I think it's quite reasonable to, you know, place a, a, the bulk of the responsibility on his shoulders here. Thank you. And then uh, we got this question. I think any of the panelists could address it, but I'm really actually curious about um, Alex's perspective here. Uh, what do you think, Alex, about some of the mandates for people to wear masks? And how do you mandate? This is a very interesting issue for us at Defending Rights and Dissent, because for years we've been opposing bills that prohibited people from wearing masks, mostly at protests. And now we have, you know, everyone has to wear a mask bill. Um, so that's rather ironic for us. But what, what do you think about them, Alex? Yeah, obviously there there are a lot of places that have these uh, laws against wearing masks. I, ironically, some of them were originally created to, uh, as an impediment to the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. To 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 prevent their their wearing of masks and holding holding mass rallies. But of course, more recently they they've been used against uh, you know anti corporate globalization protesters, Black Bloc folks, etc. Uh, in New York, the statute, though, says that it has to be three or more people. Uh, and I think there might be some similar language in, in D.C. about that. So, so an individual and also usually includes some menacing has to be occurring. But uh, regardless, yeah, it is an, an ironic situation. But the, the issue here is just one of enforcement. It doesn't really matter what the law says. What matters is what the police are enforcing. So uh, what we'll see is, you know, police will not obviously be enforcing those mask laws. And, and we're getting, you know, advice from credible health professionals that we should do this. So I think we should do it. But of course, uh, we want to be deeply concerned about the use of police as the primary tool for enforcing this and certainly taking, you know, punitive action arrests. It's one thing to get on the loudspeaker and say, you know, you shouldn't be outside in a group or put a mask on. It's another thing to be, you know, tackling people on the subway. Any of the other panelists have thoughts on, on the mask, mandatory wearing of masks? Yeah, I, I will say that um, I, I think it's a missed opportunity, frankly, for, for law enforcement in this circumstance instead of arresting people, or at least contemplating arresting people that don't have a mask, uh, to the extent that they can get them, their hands on masks themselves, they should be passing out masks to people who don't have them. Yes. You know, that's a missed opportunity fundamentally for law enforcement uh, to actually you know, create a different climate and, and create a different uh, incentive structure here uh, to actually help people out. I, I just wanna jump in and say, I don't actually know that it would be a good thing for police to be handing out masks. They're not public health workers and they have a tendency to escalate. In fact, it's a huge problem that instead of sending mental health or public health or medical providers to respond to crises, our society already sends police too frequently to deal with those and police have a tendency to escalate. Um, Chicago has a problem of sending SWAT teams uh, to respond to mental health crises. So I. I would make the case that um, we actually need uh, health institutions to do that, not law enforcement. I mean, Alex, do you think there's any role for police to hand out masks? I, I believe in Mexico City, they, they were doing that. People brought that up. Or you think that just given the nature of policing, that's a total mistake? Yeah, in Mexico City, also in Spain, you know, police have been giving out uh, masks at public transit hubs. So this is the problem, right? As I mentioned before, we've created a situation where the only flexible resource that a lot of these cities have is the police. And interestingly, in San Francisco, because of the risk of earthquakes, they wrote into city employee contracts the fact that in, a, in, a, in an emergency situation, that city workers could be repurposed at will by the mayor for an appropriate public response to the emergency. So they've got librarians preparing meals for healthcare workers. They've got <coughs> sanitation people doing childcare for other frontline workers. So that might be a way to approach this, which is to say, let's utilize the resources 
more effectively than just imagining that the police are the solution to everything because their role can in fact be destabilizing. If someone is afraid of the police, is wanted, has had bad experiences, that may be, make them less likely to comply with the mask law because they're instead just gonna try to avoid that police officer. Did any of the other panelists want to weigh in on that issue? If not, I'm going to go to a, a question for Ken, but I, I know this is a controversial topic and there's a number of opinions on this panel on it. I just want to make sure everyone feels heard. Um, so Ken, you've written about how the coronavirus pandemic has impacted voting in the primaries. Do you see this having an impact on uh, the elections in November? Oh, certainly. Um, I should point out that the article I wrote, uh, sort of looking at this, um, looked at the Bernie campaign, which of course uh, was pretty un unconventional in a lot of ways. Heavy emphasis on door to door, um, you know, on on face to face interaction. So um, I don't know that that would generalize to a more conventional campaign, like uh, presumably Biden's will be, judging from you know how it has been executed. Um, but I think it's inconceivable that it won't have an effect on um, turnout in that, uh, you know, different different interests are going to unfortunately um, handle this in a way almost exclusively consistent with um, their own sort of political and power aims. Um, so yes, I, I think it absolutely will. And, and, and that will be, because uh, the notion that this is going to um, be a problem that's resolved in the next few months, while that may be something that the president is messaging and that Frankly, many um, public leaders are, I, I, I think that the media is going to, if anything, downplay how much of a threat um, and how long of a threat coronavirus will pose because of the um, you know, harmful effect that, that, that it has in the economy. And, and just, I think there is a appreciation for um, the fact that um, you know, the economic system, uh, certainly Wall Street um, reflects perceptions to a big extent. So um, I, I would be very wary of, of any idea that, that this is going to resolve um, by the time November rolls around. So yes, I, I do think it'll be a major um, uh, determinant um, of, of what happens. So Azade, um, earlier I asked Alex, since he works with policing and, and, and incarceration, how he felt about sort of activists using this moment to push for less policing and incarceration. There's been sort of a parallel process in relationship to ICE detention that, that you've been part of. How would you assess the moment we're in right now? with sort of activism against ICE detention and for immigrants' rights? Is it being hampered by the coronavirus? Is it inspiring people to take protests who weren't before? Is it just a bleak landscape or a hopeful one? Yeah, I think it's definitely ramping up activism um, around this issue. You know, even people who weren't previously involved uh, are starting to view this issue as a public health matter. Um, you know, of course, we're in more difficult terrain just in terms of organizing generally, um, because, you know, I mean, for example, Project South, part of the organizing is, you know, long term organizing, but also just being able to show up, you know, in the streets. And now, um, obviously, you know, with social distancing rules and everything, that's just becoming more and more um, difficult. But I think people are very creative in terms of coming up with means of, um, you know, organizing and mobilizing and showing up um, that are also, um, you know, in uh, compliance with the guidelines. Um, so, um, you know, as I mentioned before, people have been showing up um, in front of detention centers, just, you know, sitting in their cars or otherwise, or coming up with other uh, mechanisms to push. But yeah, I think that definitely the energy is way up uh, in terms of at least getting people released temporarily. And I think once people are free, then um, perhaps there's a opportunity for folks in the broader public to realize that there is no need for these detention centers. They can go away and um, everything, everybody's gonna be okay. Uh, thank you for that. So we are at technically at time. I'm gonna give each of the panelists um, 20 seconds, and I have my stopwatch feature on my phone up, so I'm going to hold you to exactly 20 seconds to give any final statements, and then I will close us out. Um, I guess we should go in reverse order of how we went. So Sarah, do you want to start? 20 seconds? Sure. So because I'm an editor for a labor magazine, I would be remiss 
if I did not make sure that listeners know that the Cato Institute is funded by okay. the Cook Foundation. Can we, not, can we not do this? I don't, I don't think this is obvious. Okay. Can I just finish what I was? Yes, yes you can. Um, so I, I bring this up um, respectfully because Patrick mentioned private public partnerships and I think uh, that private public partnerships at a time of um, ma you know, mass suffering and poverty that we're seeing right now um, would be spell out disaster and erosion of public goods. I, I, it felt important to say that uh, with respect for the panel. Yeah, and obviously there is a lot of diversity on this panel. I, I know Pat's at Cato. I know several people have been active and democratic socialist on this panel. So it was purposely chosen to be a cross-section ideologically. Um, Alex, do you have any final thoughts? And you're gonna be held to 20 seconds. Just, just as the, as the, you know, forces of, uh, of elite power will try to use this moment to reshape the country in ways that meet their interests, you know, we need to use this moment to reshape the country in a way that, that meets our interests. And we need to point out all those vulnerabilities that this system has produced that the coronavirus has exploited and demand that we create new infrastructures that reduce those vulnerabilities. And we can just look at the Thank much you. lower death toll in Germany as an example. 20 seconds. And then Pat, you now have 20 seconds and I'm also gonna hold you to that. So I think it's important to, to make note of the fact that, again, this has started out as a failure of government. And if we don't take a look back at how we got into this circumstance in terms of how government failed us here, we set ourselves up for yet another failure. And th that's why it's important for Congress to come back in and do its job. Uh, thank you. And then I believe the individual after that is Ken. Am I remembering correctly? I think so, yeah. Um, I would say that uh, as we litigate, uh, you know, who's at fault here, uh, I again want to point out the, the intelligence community and notified the uh, White House repeatedly of the threat posed by this months in advance, um, that there was plenty of planning uh, to the effect of how to respond to it. And I would also say that um, in, in terms of how to respond to it in real time, uh, we have the resources, they exist. Uh, the federal government has the resources to do this. The question is if there's a political will to execute that, whether that's via the military or uh, you know other agency um, they, they have the money to do it. The question is if uh, they can be held to account to do so. Yes, and then we're going to end with Azade. Thank you. Uh, so I'm actually going to speak about something different, um, but related. So Sarah sp spoke very eloquently about the need to dis uh, dismantle the uh, military industrial complex. And I want folks to remember that sanctions, US sanctions are very much part of that. Um, you know, U.S. imperialism, and it's something that we need to be very cognizant of, especially at this moment, where Iran is one of the countries very badly hit by the pandemic, and where there are a set of really brutal U.S. sanctions that are affecting the population right now. Um, U.S. sanctions against Venezuela, Cuba, other countries really need to be lifted. And so hopefully Thank we can use the energy of this moment to yeah, I want to thank both you and Sarah for bringing the issue of, of sanctions up. Sarah and I were actually on a panel last week together about how U.S. sanctions serve as a weapon of war. Um, I want to thank all of the panelists for being on tonight. Um, my name is Chip Gibbons. I am the policy director of Defending Rights and Dissent. I wanted to um, thank Defending Rights and Dissent for letting me be their policy director. Um, I want to thank the nation as well for co-sponsoring this. I want to Thank all the panelists for letting me moderate with such a prestigious group of people. Um, I am very humbled and honored to be here. And then I want to just go over our panel one last time. It was Sarah Lazar in these times, Alex Vitali, professor of sociology, Brooklyn College, author of The End of Policing, Azadeh Shashahani of Project South, Patrick Eddington, Cato, Ken Klippenstein, DC correspondent for The Nation. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined online. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Defending Rights and Dissent is going to be doing more of these. Uh, we're going to start doing some topic specific ones. We're looking specifically at doing one on, on, on policing and incarceration, as well as one on, on labor, because there's been a lot of protests in, in with labor unions, with 
Amazon workers, and there's been a lot of pushback against that as well. So those are things we're looking at doing next. Um, I hope you will participate in them as well. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye. Yeah.